In the U.S.-Japan alliance, we're, we're very short, focused on the short-term adjustments, I think, to China's rise. And we're in the middle of conver a conversation over the U.S.-Japan defense cooperation guidelines. And those, those are expected. At least an interim report is expected momentarily. Uh, I suspect, though, that we ought to also be looking at not just adapting to what's already happened, but looking down the pike a little bit more, a longer-term perspective. Many analysts have already begun to predict that China's military will far uh, outstrip the Japanese in a decade or a decade and a half, and in fact may even challenge the United States. I think there's a little bit more analysis that needs to be done in terms of how China's capabilities are affecting their behavior. I think we kind of just assume that the more capabilities they have, the more outrageous their behavior could become. And that anticipation, I think, is making many in Tokyo and indeed around the region somewhat nervous. But I think if we take a calmer, uh, more focused and that analytical look at the interaction between capabilities and how the Chinese are behaving with those capabilities, we'll see, I think, that the Chinese are learning too, that they're not necessarily all that comfortable yet in terms of their military ambitions in the region and the, the region's reaction to them. So I think we'll learn a lot by looking more carefully at the ADIZ announcement, for example, and uh, our response, China's accommodation of our concerns, and we'll learn perhaps a, a better way uh, with our allies like Japan to shape Chinese behavior before they start making changes in their policy. And I hope that that will let China and the United States and its neighbors in the Asia Pacific have a much more confident and perhaps more measured process of accommodating the rise in Chinese capabilities and power.